Amen. Praise the Lord. A couple of things bring your attention. One is, praise the Lord, Vacation Bible School this last week was phenomenal. You guys did a fantastic job. Somebody praise the Lord for those guys. Appreciate all those people that put so much time in our children's lives, the ministry they have for them. Also, we had our funeral and memorial service, more of a celebration service yesterday for Brother Don Height. I want to say thank you again. You know, this church is just about the neatest place in the world. See how so many of you reach out and care for each other, encourage one another, minister to each other in difficult times like that. And your continuing support, I just sat back and just gleam, you know, just thinking of, with excitement and uh, just with a, a, a good type of pride in, in the body of Christ here and how they respond to the needs of other people. It was a great, great time of the Lord. In fact, somebody, you know, me and my sensitivity... Uh, came to me from the other campus this morning and said, hey, that's just what I want my funeral to be like. I said, yeah, but yours won't take but half that time. <laughs> he said, why? I said, because we can't say all those nice things about you. <laughs> I said, so I want you to get your life in order. Get to living for Jesus so we can say all that nice stuff about you. I know I just kind of had to pull my foot out of my mouth when I was done and apologize again. I'm learning slowly but surely. Now, don't look at me that way. You wouldn't apologize. You just smiled and went on your way. But uh, it was a, a, a great celebration time in the Lord. We're in this series of messages on the miracles of Jesus. Uh, in fact, today we're getting into, I believe, it's part 14 of our, our miracles on the, the water walk in part one. And we broke this down into two because you know me, when you have as many verses that this takes, this miracle takes, it's about 11 or 12 verses. I can't preach 11 or 12 verses in one sermon. You know, you just, there's just too much to miss. It's just, you're just going to miss a lot. So we're going to break it down into two messages. In fact, I plagiarized a little bit because years ago I read a book by Jack Taylor called The Spirit-Filled Life. And he took this particular passage from Matthew 14 and uh, just kind of laid it out so neatly and just kind of sliced it up so perfectly. I stole his outline. Of course, he probably stole it from somebody else. It all comes from the Bible anyway, so praise the Lord. Someone told me the secret to originality is obscure resources. So uh, I'll just be honest and confess mine. But this was, it was a great book, but it really ministered to me at a time in my life. And I, I needed a word from the Lord and I was a young believer in Christ. And it was really just a, a powerful message to me. And then we started looking at these miracles of Jesus and I came across this and said, well, you know, I, I preached this outline before. I'm going to go back and get it again. Uh, there's just so much there that we can receive from it. And it really fits so appropriately with, uh, I guess you might call the vision or the passion of Believer's Fellowship. When we started Believer's Fellowship 25 years ago, the desire was this. As we gathered with a small group of people in that room in a hotel up on 1960 and 45, was that we want a church that's unique. God's calling us to do something very unique and something very special. We don't want to do business as usual. We don't want to be nominal, you know, and just average. We don't want people just to come to church and walk out and say, oh, that was a nice service, but did you see what brother so-and-so was wearing or sister kind of shoes she had on? And, and uh, you know, that's a bad girl singing in the group, man. She just hit a really bad note. And, you know, and lives are unchanged. It's business as usual. And, you know, but we went to church, bless the Lord. You know, and people are mad and criticizing and splitting all the time and joining church split after another. But just didn't want to see that. We believe that uh, God had something very unique for his people. So we wanted a church that was always crying out, calling out, and preaching out to let's go deeper with Christ. Let's never be content with status quo. Let's not get settled into nominality. Let's preach messages. Let our study groups and lift and everything we do, let them all have, have lessons and messages that always calling people to a, to a higher place and to a deeper walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, to call people out to, to a deeper commitment you know, let's, let's go a little further. Let's reach a little higher than we've reached before. Let's go this week, and as we leave the service, let's go thinking, hey, there's something more I can do in, in, in my love for Christ and my fellowship with Christ. I don't want to be uh, where I was last year in my spiritual walk in life. And so the goal of what we do in so many areas and so many ways, is, as far as Christians are concerned in Believer's Fellowship, is to always not only just to encourage you, to feed you, to strengthen you, but to also to press you to, hey, let's take it further. We can be more. We can do more. We can see more. 
Let's never be content, you know, with yesterday's bread. Amen. Let's see God do something. In the processes we've gone through these miracles, you can see that's exactly what the Lord Jesus has been doing over this three year period. We're in that last year of his ministry now. And every miracle that we've seen, as we've said before and repeat every Sunday, is a sign. And that's the literal translation for the word miracle means sign. Every miracle was supernatural, yes, phenomenal, outside the means of explanation of mankind. It was supernatural. But they were also there to testify to the fact Jesus is the Lord. He's the King of glory. He's the Son of God. So every miracle was like a billboard on the highway of life that declared the glory of God in Christ Jesus, that he's Messiah. He's the one that was promised. So we see that. But in the process, what we've also watched in this is that there are practical applications in every one of these miracles for our life. If we'll listen, if we'll pay attention, there's a word for us where God wants to speak to us because the word of God is alive and has a message for us. Especially as we've watched the disciples from day one when they've been called from that miracle, you know, at the wedding feast, followed by the miracle of fishes where Jesus calls them to follow him up to this point. The last couple of weeks, we talked about uh, the miracle of the fish and, and, and the bread, remember? And then we had Father's Day message. We talked about the demon possessed boy. But remember, even I, I believe it was Mark at the second feeding of the 5,000 or 4,000 that were in the second feeding of the fish and bread. It was obvious that the disciples still weren't getting it. They hadn't learned the first lesson. And so the Lord repeats that same miracle. Uh, and, and one place, the first time it's before a bunch of Hebrew people. The next time there's more of a mixed congregation of Gentiles and Jews there. But obviously we saw from the responses they still weren't quite getting it. There's always, with every miracle, amazement. You know, wonderment is just, well, it, it, it's just blow, sometimes a recognition of their own sinfulness because of the might and power of God. Sometimes a, rec a, a recognition of the ability of God to sustain them or meet their needs or whatever it might be. But there was always a message there for them. Now, with this miracle, it seems that they finally are starting to get it. All right. Because this is the miracle. It's also around that Caesarea Philippi connection where Jesus said, whom do my men say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ. Son of the living God. Well, when this miracle ends, we'll see the last verse we read from the passage in just a moment. They make a declaration. You are the son of God. So their eyes are opening. They have to get this message down. The cross is coming soon. So we've, we've kind of been able not only to speak about the miracles of Jesus. We've seen his ministry and how it's affected not only the, the religious leaders. We've seen how it affected the masses. And now we've seen how it affected the disciples. And that deeper lesson that he was wanting them to learn in every one of these instances. And with every message he preached where he was, where, where he was taking them. So in Matthew 14 is our passage. We'll start with verse 22 and read through verse 33. Immediately he made the disciples to get into the boat and go ahead of him of the other side and while he sent the crowds away. And after he sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately... Jesus stretched out his hand, took hold of him and said to him, you have a little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped and all those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, you are certainly God's son. Now, this is a supernatural thing. I mean, nobody just walks on water. I mean, anybody here want to volunteer? I have some. We have a Baptist trip in the corner. We would all like to see. We'll put it on YouTube, by the way, if you can do it. But uh, outside this invitation to Peter to walk on water was this great demonstration of the presence of God. Of course, a lot of people, they'll focus on that little central part of those few verses there where, where Peter starts looking at the waves. They forget to read the part where it said Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water to Jesus. Then he failed, and yes, Jesus rescued him, and guess what? They went back to the boat together, walking on the water. 
So before you castigate and throw stones at poor Peter for his failure to walk on water, let me see you try it. Amen. Because he did walk on water and, he, you know, there was failure. And we'll talk about that a little bit in this, this week and, and in next week's message. But in, re, in the context of where we're at, as we've said, there's a message, a practical message that God speaks to our heart. Uh, let's, let's break it down like this and to make it real simple for us as we talk about what it means to us. One is I'd like to draw a little typology here about the boat in the water. The boat represents the commonplace, the routines of life, the rut, if you want to call it. The, where circumstances control you, the wind's blowing, the storms arise, and you just kind of drift wherever it goes, wherever the current kind of flows. And that's the way a lot of people live their life. They live their life just kind of seated in the boat, and when the winds of a bad economy blow, they just kind of go with it. It's just, you know, if I don't feel good, then I don't act good. If I don't feel right, I don't live right. And it's just whatever I feel, it's emotional. It's, 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 it's like living in the, just a, stuck in a rut. And we, we've talked about the rut before. That's it's just a grave where the ends kicked out, you know, just kind of going through with, with the nominal kind of life that's based up on what circumstances are dictating. That's just kind of where I go. Now, there's a lot of Christians that live their lives that way. All right. On the other hand, I believe what the Lord has called us to is to be out on the water. And that represents that place of divine dependency, you know, where Jesus is, where, where life is different, where it is a life of faith now. We're not controlled by the things that are outside of us. We're controlled by the Lord who lives in us. And our lives are different. Our lives are unique. There's something unique about our lives that people can see and people can witness. It's different. It's a faith life. Now, we talk about as a church where we want to call people to a deeper walk. This is what this message is really all about. To get out of status quo. Maybe you've settled into some place, all right? And you're just kind of there. You're not really going forward. You're not really seem to be drifting too far back, but you're not growing in Christ. You know, I think it was Manly Beasley who made that great statement. If, if, if you know, if, if you love Jesus, if you don't love Jesus more than, than you loved Jesus last year, if you don't love him more today than you did last year, then you're backslidden. Boy, that's such a truth, isn't it? If we're, we don't love him more today than we did yesterday, then somewhere something's failing because it ought to be an ever increasing. It ought to be moving forward. It ought to be, you know, it ought to be God doing something in our lives. So for people who don't know Christ, it, this, this water life represents getting out of the boat of your self-controlled life and being controlled by the world and the flesh and the devil to getting out where Jesus is at the center of your life and he's controlling your life. If, if you're saved and you know Christ, and you've settled into mediocrity in your life, this is, this is a message that calls you out of that and says, let's go deeper. Let's be something greater for Christ. Let's, let's do something that makes a difference in the world around us. So, you know, it means really just, I'm going to follow Jesus today where Jesus is in my life today. It, there, there might be a lot of uh, uncertainties about it, but hey, there are glorious uncertainties. It, it literally means... I'm going to climb out of myself and climb out onto Jesus. It literally means I am sick and tired of being controlled and living the same way I've been living. I want to see God do something real in my life. Now, I think that every child of God, if we really are believers, has that in us. We, we want God to do something. We, we, we just, there's some, that's the Holy Spirit, you know. He's doing his job in us to, to, to make us and to, to lead us and to guide us to be more like Christ and to want more of Christ in our lives, to experience more of God in our life. So this message is, is a call to, to become a water walker, to get out of the boat of commonplace, to get out of the boat that's controlled by the wind and the waves and by the crisis of the world around us, you know. That no longer is my life being mandated by my feelings or my emotions or by the economics of the day. Hey, Jesus is where it is going on and wherever he is, that's where I want to be. And you say, Pastor, that's me. That's where I want my life. That's, that's what I want and that's what I, I'd like to see in my own heart and life. So what does that mean for you? I'll push the right button here. I'll get it going. First of all, before you step out of the boat, all right, and slip off your sandals or whatever it might be, I want you to consider some things. Some things you should know before you decide that you, too, want to be a water walker. Number one is pretty simple. 
The invitation to be a water walker usually comes in the midst of crisis and storms and difficulties in life. And Matthew 14 says the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed to and fro with the waves, for the waves, the wind were contrary. They had a goal to get to the other side. They weren't reaching the goal. Why? Because the winds were contrary. Everything was pushing against them. They had somewhere they wanted to be, but everything's pushing them back to keep them from getting where they're supposed to be going. Can't make it. Can't get there. Everything's against us. In fact, the word contrary is a Greek word which literally has to do with antagonism. The winds were antagonistic. The waves were antagonistic. It wasn't easy. I, have, I know where I'm supposed to be, but I'm not getting there. There's too many conflicts. There's too many difficulties, too many trials, too many obstacles that are standing in my way. So I, I'm not really getting through here because there's too much antagonism that's going on. Well, it's interesting to know that the Lord's call for us to go deeper usually comes in times like that. I think it's usually those times when we, we have a tendency to be a little more sensitive to the voice of God. When we realize things are really out of our control anyway. I, I really believe most of us think that things, for the most of part of time, are in our control, uh, but they're not. Even Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Yeah. It's really out of a lot of our control. We, we, we think about the times, you know, that are good. We, we, you know, we kind of like those good times. Why? Many times we like the good times because it doesn't really require anything of us. We can just kind of coast. But, you know, God didn't call you to be a coaster, all right? You're going to be a coaster, we'll put a glass on your head. All right. But that's not that's not what God called you to. That's not what God called you for. And so he puts you in situations many times in your life so that you will hear from him and so that you will you will listen to him. All right. In fact, the Bible, if we read it from the from the King James, I think it says he commanded them to get in the boat. The Lord knew what was going on. The Lord knew what was coming up. The Lord knew what they were going to face. But isn't it interesting? He put them in the boat anyway. And I, I know some of you doubt God's wisdom at different times when you're out on the oceans of life and things are not going like you at all had anticipated. Things are antagonistic. It's not working out. It could be in your family, your home, your finances, whatever. It is. It's just not doing what it's supposed to do. All right. No, this is the, those, th these are the times when you really need to slow down and listen to what God's saying to you. And, and what most people do is they just kind of go down with the boat or quit or try to swim back to the other shore they came from. And that's not what God is wanting to do here. He's trying to say something to you. And it usually comes, that call to get out of your boat usually comes out in the middle of the storm. And when it comes out in the middle of the storm, you know, it's, it's, it, you know that's the time to listen and not to bail out. Two, it's always meant to enlarge us. Many times we feel just the opposite. We think that it's out there to endanger us. But what the Lord is wanting to do is to do something deeper and to broaden their walk with him. And it's the same in our life. The Bible says this, whom the Lord loveth, he maketh fat. And I knew some of you were looking for a verse, so you want the address for that scripture. <laughs> well, it's in several places in the Psalm. But the idea is not physical enlargement, all right? Although we like to think that sometimes, it really means the Lord increases our spiritual borders. He enlarges us and our capacity to know him, our ability to discern him is ever increasing and ever growing. Whom the Lord loveth, he wants to enlarge. So when we have these antagonistic times in our life, in our marriage, whatever it may be. Those things are not there to push us apart from each other or to separate us from God. Those should be the things that push us together. Those are the things that will make our life mean something. Those are the things that will make our families mean something. Those are the times that make our worth as people in this world mean something. He's wanting to do something deeper and to enlarge us. But often we miss what the Lord is up to and we're just kind of just eking out life as it goes through. In Psalms 106, the story of the children of Israel is told while they're wandering through the wilderness. And it says in, in Psalms 106, they forgot his works and they did not wait for his counsel, but they lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and God did test them in the desert. In other words, it's in those desert times, the storm times, the conflict times, where God is calling us to, let's, let's, let's deepen you. Let's do something that, 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 that makes a difference. Let's, let's do something that outside your abilities, where you really get to experience my abilities being given to you. But they didn't get it, and they didn't hear the lesson. In fact, in Psalms 106, it says, you know, he gave them what they wanted, 
but he sent leanness to their souls. And they were always wanting something more. I need bread, we need quail, we need manna, we, what, you know. Shoes didn't wear out, clothes didn't wear out. They got so much of what they requested. God did bless them, but it didn't change their life. And I know that's not our, 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 our thinking. We actually think that if God would give me what I'm asking for, it would change my life. And many times the very things we're requesting from God are the very things that will destroy our lives. And we need to be a little more discerning, have a little more maturity about our life so that God can speak to us. Because the last thing we want to experience is leanness of the soul. We want to be strong. We want to be capable. We want to be able to stand up to the conflicts and to the crisis and to the problems that come, no matter what they will be. But hey, if a crisis comes and you're lean in your soul, you better listen to what God's saying because you're not going to get through. And you're not going to make it through life. So... It always is meant to enlarge and it's never meant to endanger. The third thing is, it's there to help you get your identity straight. What's important? What's, you know, what's, 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 what's the most important thing? Obviously, it's the Lord. Now, understand the Lord has sent them. They're out in the storm. Waves, wind, the whole thing's happening. It's frightening already. And they see Jesus coming and they say, it's a ghost. They, no. They probably said, it's a ghost! <laughs> That's more like it, wouldn't you think? It's a ghost! Why? Because men don't walk on water. And we got that, right? And again, if you can, we're waiting for the demonstration. People don't walk on water. It's absurd. It's unbelievable. It's incredible that anybody... So this is a normal response you know, from the flesh. And, and it's kind of response we give. Oh, it's, it's not going to work out. Everything's falling apart. My life just, oh, you know. It's just, we just freak out. And we, we, with this, these are the points that we need to slow down and realize we do not serve a natural God. We serve a supernatural God. We've not been called to be natural people. We are supernatural people. We've not been called to live natural lives. We've been called to live supernatural lives. We're not called to live like everybody else lives. We're called to live in the presence and in the, in the power and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a ghost is a natural response. But hey, something else needs to occur here, you know. You need to realize it's not a ghost and that God is up to something. In fact, Peter, you know, he's the one who said, well, Lord, if it's you... If it is you, because you are this central theme here, Jesus is what sh should be the, the, the subject of the matter in our life at all times. How does this fit into God's plans? What does God do in my life? Where is Christ and all that's going on in me? Because if, if Jesus is just something you do on Sundays, I hate to tell you folks, that's a miserable way to live. Uh, it really is. It's just, it's just dull. We'll see it in a moment. We'll talk about it a bit more. But it's not what God desires for our life. So the best thing when the storm comes is to look for Christ and then to identify Christ and to listen to Christ, you know, and, and, and to respond to Christ and whatever he says. Now, Peter's in the boat. There's all the disciples in the boat. There's 12 of them there. Only Peter cries out. All right. He speaks out. He saw the Lord. And then the Lord, when he spoke to him, responded to him. And that's all he needed was a word from Jesus and a sight of Jesus. Get, get a glimpse of Jesus and a word from Jesus and let's go. Now that's not sufficient for most folks. Even though God's given a little glimpse of his glory in their heart, even though he's spoken clearly from his word and he can be seen clearly in his word, we still will doubt and we'll still kind of hold on to our boat. You know, hold on to where we're sitting or maybe we'll, we might even kind of try to work our way against our other brothers to get a little better seat in the boat. <laughs> but nobody's trying to get out of the boat. Except Peter, if it's you, by the way, you ought to make sure it's Jesus before you get out. <laughs> That's a good thing to do, all right? If you're just looking for a testimony, you're sunk. If it's all about you and showing off or jockeying for a better position in the boat, hey, you know, the, 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 it's not going to work out for you. Don't just look for something like that. Somebody just I just want out of the storm, Pastor. Just give me out. No, it's time to get out of the boat. And trust Christ in these, these times of your life and believe God because he's really wanting to do something deeper in your life. So make sure that in the middle of everything you're experiencing, that Jesus is there. You're looking to Jesus. You're trusting Jesus. And whatever he says to do at that point, you're willing to do and you're willing to obey him. And if you are, you'll discover this fourth thing about this. Water walking will be an opportunity for real and lasting victory. Why? Because now it's not about you. It's not about the circumstance. It's not about the trial. It's not about the conflict. Now it's about Jesus and you. Now it's about life in reality. It, you're not just sitting around anymore talking about what God's going to do for you. Now you're going to experience God do something through you. 
There's a lot of people, even in this room today, who can tell you a lot of good things that the Lord has done for them, but they haven't stepped out of the boat completely because that's pretty much their life. What's God doing for me? But true Christianity, water walk in faith is when you begin to experience God move through you. Your life's a ministry. Your life is different. Your life makes, makes the difference. You know, when, when problems start, you know, mounting around people's lives, they're going to hear what you have to say because they've seen the difference in you. There's something about your life that's unique. Christ is alive in you. It's not just, well, I put it together however I want to put it together and that should work for me and I hope it works for everybody else. No. In fact, I believe people are looking for that kind of victory. I believe people are looking for a lasting victory. I believe people are looking, and I believe God is looking. The scripture makes it clear that his eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for someone. What's he looking at? Someone that he can demonstrate his life through. Someone he can show his grace through. Someone he can show his power through. So that there's something unique about your life. The people you work with know it's, you're different. Not because you're just moral, but because God's grace rests upon your life because you're not choosing to live like everybody else. Lasting victory. Genuine victory, not just kind of fixing things to get through to the next day. God's doing something special in your life. So those are the, those are the things you should know before you attempt water walking. Uh, the reasons are pretty simple. I, I, ju I just have two in, in regard to the reasons for water walking. One is I'm just sick and tired of being sick and tired. Dissatisfaction with the boat life is number one. Why? It's dull. It's guilt ridden. It's helpless. It's unproductive. I mean, it, it's safe, but it's sour. You know, it's cozy, perhaps, but it's cold. There's few and little victories and no lasting victories. And it's guilt ridden because, you know, uh, you're not where God wants you to be. And you just know that in your heart when you're not where you're supposed to be. It, it, it's something the Holy Spirit just shows you. Hey, you're not where you're supposed to be. And, and you come to church and the pastor preaches something like this and you're just more guilt ridden. You know, nobody preaches like I preach to make you feel guilty. We preach the way we preach so that you'll. Get out of the boat. Rise to the occasion. Quit letting the storm run your life. Reach for a higher goal. Be something greater for God than what you've been. And if you're not, then you're not happy. Why? Because you, when you were recreated in Christ Jesus, you were built for a battle. I mean, you've been made for a fight. You have been thrust on the battle lines, on the front lines of spiritual warfare. The enemy is the devil. His demons, his minions hate you. They pose a threat every day on every level. You can't walk out with no armor, no sword, no shield, no helmet, and expect not to get beat up. You walk out into the battle ready for a fight. And the victory already has been won by Christ at the cross. So you have what you need. Amen. But if not, then you live this kind of unproductive, helpless little life. You're at the control and, the, and the, 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 the mercy of the waves and the wind and the culture and economics and social trends and the systems of this world. You know, they just push you and mold you and press you. The Bible says don't be conformed to this world. In other words, don't let those things shape you. We're letting Christ shape us. But if you're living this kind of life in the boat, it, it, you, there's, there's not fruit. It's just failure. There's not faith, it, it's fear. There's not peace, there's confusion. There's, there's not victory, there's really just defeat. There's no hope in the boat, just helplessness. There's no glory. And the scripture says, Paul wrote the church, he says, you walk as men. So I am a man, what's wrong with that? No, you're not a man. You're not just a woman if you belong to Christ. You're a priest. You're a warrior. You're a soldier. You're a salt. You are light. You are king. The Bible makes very clear that we are not of this world any longer. We are just passing through. And in the passing process, we're making a difference. We're making a difference. So a good reason to get out of the boat and get on the water is because uh, it stinks in the boat. Hey Amen. There's no challenge in the boat. Well, most churches are fighting and splitting and arguing over stuff. You know, when people get bored, they start murmuring. When people are, are just, just nominal, then it 
Everybody starts looking inward instead of outward. We got a world around us that's dying and going to hell. We've got the answer. Why would we just sit here and say, oh, it's nice to have the answer. <laughs> Let's go out and be the answer and live the answer. The second reason that we get out of the boat, I think, is pretty obvious as well. I want to be where Jesus is. The desire to get where Jesus is should be the driving desire, whatever it takes in my life to be whatever God wants me to be in my life. I am sick of not being where Jesus is in my life. I need to get to where the action is. I mean, the prime motive, all right? The prime driving motive for all this is to be where God is and in God's will and in God's plan and in God's grace, not under the constant hand of chastening and missing God in my life. Unfortunately, Jesus is not around a lot of folks, you know. It's not around a lot of people because they won't get out to where he is and, and get to after the water and, and they'd rather play it safe. They, they become mastered by the sea instead of the master of the sea mastering them. Remember, on, on the water where Jesus is, he has already demonstrated that he has the ability to control the wind and control the waves. He's already demonstrated that in past miracles. Now, now, folks, this isn't an invitation to head up to the baptistry and try to walk on water out to the local Lake Conroe or whatever and, and try your skills out at walking on water. But it is an invitation to step out on the water of divine dependency. I'm going to trust God with my life. I, I don't, I don't want to live a dull and predictive, helpless, guilt-ridden life. I, I want to be what God wants me to be. And I want to be where God is. I think that's the heart of the lesson. Now, 12 men in a boat, only one of them got out. All right? Only one of them got out. The other's probably sitting around talking about Peter. There he goes again. He's just out of his mind. Stupid, stupid is, stupid does. He's going to drown. He got out of the boat. He knew it was Jesus. All he needed was a sight of Jesus and a word from Jesus, and he climbed out. And I'm sure, you know, when he got out of the boat and started walking on water, they're all looking at each other uh, and maybe Thomas said something like this. Oh, I was going to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to do that. And then a lot of people, I was going to. And they weren't either. And then a lot of people sat around saying, you know, one day I'm, I'm going to do that. One day when, well, let me get past graduation. Or let me get past college or let me get past marriage. No, one day I'm, I'm quit. You're not either. Climb out of the boat now. If you want if you desire it, if you're ready for God to do something deeper in your life and go greater with God and far, farther with God, this is the time. Now, I don't know what it means to you. I know what the message means to me. Ultimately, it just kind of means I'll do whatever the Lord wants me to do. For some of you, I really believe it is as simple as giving your life to Jesus Christ. You've been a church member long enough, all right? You can die in this church. It's not going to get you to heaven. All right. You can be around some of the greatest, godliest Christians in the world and sit right in the middle with them and sing songs with them, play in the band with them, preach and teach, lead a lift group with them. That's not going to save you. All right. It's a personal decision that you're going to have to make. Well, my daddy was a spiritual man. Bless his heart. But you're going to die and go to hell if you don't get right with Jesus. And that's not what daddy wanted. That's not what your heavenly daddy wants for certain. You make a choice to get it right with God. I just, I just know, you know, whatever it is, we have the capacity in us to know what it is. Give your life to Christ. For some, you are a believer. And it may be something where God just says, forgive. It's time to forgive. But I can't. It's impossible. Get out of the boat. Amen. You'll find the impossible becomes a possibility with the presence of Jesus and the word of Jesus. God's able to do great things. Some of you just getting right with God in some area of your life. Some of it might mean start giving. Some of you so tight you squeak when you walk. You know, you just you just had this trouble when anybody mentions money and, you know, and you like to come to believers because no one passes a plate. <laughs> so I don't feel so bad when it goes by. Just the offering yourself. But hey, that's not, if you're just the kind of person, well, I'll put it the way, nobody's ever known in life for what they kept. That's right. <laughs> Amen. We're always known by what we give. Look at the great people in history. They gave. They gave their lives. They gave their funds. They gave themselves. They're always giving. And that's the life of the believer. Look at Jesus. He gave it all. And our life should be marked by an attitude of just, just giving. I, I talked to a widow this, this last week and she was sharing a testimony with me. She said, you know, uh, my husband passed away, the major breadwinner and everything. And I'm, I'm trying to make a living. And I was in church two weeks ago and the Lord told me to give $100. She said, you know, I don't barely have $100. 
She said, but I knew that's what God wanted me to do. And she said, I came back again last week and you preached on giving. And I asked the Lord what I was supposed to do and I was supposed to give $50. She said, I didn't even make $50. She said, I got a check for $17,500 this week. She said, I was expecting some of it as a payoff, about, about eight or nine, maybe 10,000 at best, but this came in for $17,500. It met my need. I guess so. <laughs> But if you stay in the boat, you may get your 10. But you're not going to get the 17.5, are you? Who knows what it means for you? And those are just illustrations. But there's two things I would close with today. One, if you really want to get it, well, I'm going to say five because I think they're important. One, and I'm just going to read them off to you. Your desire to get to Jesus must be greater than your fear of the unknown. What well, was Churchill who said, you know, there's nothing to fear but fear itself? Isn't that the truth? Except this, there is something to fear, and it's God. And my fear of God is greater than my fear of the unknown. My fear of God is greater than my fear of what I'm facing. I love God more, I respect God, I honor God, and I believe Him more than I believe my emotions that would dictate. The desire factor has to rise above the fear factor. The second thing is here, I must be willing to fail. Peter failed, you know. I think the threat of failure causes a lot of people to just fail. Just the threat of itself. I think we almost have to come to this place, I'm willing to become the laughing stock of everyone here, if that's what it takes. Amen. Amen. But pride hinders that, doesn't it? But I think I'd rather fail attempting to walk on the water than just stay in the sinking boat. Wouldn't you? Yes. There must be a commitment to Jesus because this is what it's all about. Now, if you can see it, but in the letters on the screen, the two, two, T-O is in yellow. It's there to emphasize it in a different color because it's all about him anyway. This is about Christ. This is about God. This is about his will. This is about his purpose. This is about his plan. He's God. He deserves to be recognized and honored as God. And if he's God, that's where I want to be. The fourth comes in line with that. There has to be a commitment from Jesus. He said, Lord, if it's you, come. And Jesus said, come. If God's calling you to something, then do it. If God's leading you somewhere, then follow it. If God's saying something to you, say, but that's not what I want. It is what you want. You just don't know it yet. You're too blinded by your circumstances and our lack of discernment and our immaturity many times to really know what we really even want. But the Lord has made a commitment to you. That's the beautiful part of it. There was, there's a time here in these miracles that you'll see that Jesus does something and then he speaks to the people after the miracle of the bread room and he says, hey, if you really want to you know, follow me, then you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, the Hebrew people that were there, they understood what he was talking about, discipleship, all right? That was a common term in regard to covenant relationships about eating and drinking. He made it even more important that you're going to have to receive me, is what he was saying. And you're going to have to follow me and trust me. And he says, many left him that day. Another place it says, you know, that many turned from him, but Jesus knew it, that they were not committed to anyway. And another place it says, but Jesus was not committed to them. The only way that you're going to have a commitment from Jesus is when you put your heart out to him. And then once you surrender your will to him, he's committed to you. The Bible says, he which began a good work in you, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You can count on him. He will always be there. The fifth thing is, you have to take a step. Well, they say a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. You know, so many people saying, I had a guy ask me, how am I going to have this? You know, I just want to, when I get there in my life and realize that I've had a holy walk and I had a holy life. How can, how can I have a holy walk and a holy life? I said, take a holy step. Take a step. And when you finish that, it's a simple task. Then take another one. And after that, another and another. And pretty soon your holy stepping turns into a holy walk, ultimately leading to a holy life. First step is always the most difficult. When I gave my life to Jesus, that was the most difficult step to take. It was hard. Yeah, you know, I felt like I had demons holding me down. Shoes felt like they must have been glued to the floor. But I knew what I needed to do. And God graced me to take that step. But what if I fail? You cannot be concerned with step 1,143 or 7,201. That step's not important. All that's important is the step that God's telling you to take right now. And if you're ready to take it, God will meet you right there at it. But you have to take it. Whatever that means for you. I know that we're living in a day 
when so many in the church are so undisciplined. But that just means they're not discipling. If we're going to be what God's called us to be, then it's going to take steps of discipline, surrender, faith, and obedience to Him. Aren't you ready to go the next step? Aren't you ready to go just a little further than you've been before? No matter how risky it might be, no matter how you might have to break out of your shell or out of yourself, you've discovered, if you've been saved very long at all, you've never been disappointed by taking that next step. Have you? It's always that God's met you right there. Would you stand with your heads bowed?